Hi everyone and welcome to another crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of Oscar Matson and the murder of Mary Ann Maguire in North Shields in 1900. I hope you will find it interesting. But before we begin, can I just say if you do enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here or haven't already done so then please do consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. There is very little information about Oscar Matson. He was born in Russia in around 1874 and was said to be around 26 years old at the time the crime was committed. He was described as being around 5 foot 5 with brown hair and hazel eyes. He also had a tattoo of a woman on his right forearm. He worked as a seagoing fireman and mainly worked on British ships. He had been a regular visitor to North Shields over the previous five to six years and had become friendly with the victim, Mary Ann Maguire, first meeting with her when she was just a child of around 13 or 14 years old. Mary Ann Maguire, the victim, was born in around 1881 to parents James and Mary. She was born in Wall's End in an area that at the time was known as Howden Pans. The family then moved to South Shields just a few months after her birth, but by 1891 they had moved to North Shields where her father worked as a boiler maker. She had one known brother named James. Her mother had died around five years before the murder took place and at this time she had left her father's house, first moving to Sunderland for a short time and then she had found a room in Bland Square in Bell Street in North Shields where she lived until her death. In early August of 1900, Oscar was once again in North Shields and had gone to visit Mary Ann. They had spent a couple of days together and on Monday, August the 13th, Rebecca Varty went to visit Mary Ann at her rooms in Bland Square at around 9am. On her way up the stairs, she met Oscar coming down with a can in his hand. This would have been a can similar to a billy can used for the purpose of buying drink to take out from the local public houses. She asked him where he was going and he said he was going for some beer. He asked her to come with him and have a drink but she said no and continued up to Mary Ann's room. When she entered the room, she saw Mary Ann lying face down on the bed. She had first thought she was asleep and on attempting to wake her, she found a black silk handkerchief tied tightly round her neck. Rebecca now believed that Mary Ann was dead, so she immediately went to look for help. She went to a shop in Bland Square where she found Elizabeth Rogerson and told her what she had seen. Elizabeth then went with her to the room where she quickly realised that Mary Ann was indeed dead. She then sent Rebecca for the police and a doctor. Afterwards, the body of Mary Ann Maguire was removed to what was then called the Dead House, which was just another name for a mortuary, at the Low Lights in North Shields. While this had been going on, Oscar, Oscar had gone to the Cobble Inn on Bell Street, which was very close to Ban Bland Square. Here, he had asked for some beer and a brandy and soda, placing the can and sixpence on the bar counter. For whatever reason, he quickly left the pub, leaving the can behind. Just a few minutes later, he met two young men by the names of John Smith and Robert Young. He spoke to them, saying, Will you please take charge of me and take me to the police station? I have killed her. The men asked who, but Oscar had simply said, Never you mind. If you don't take me, I will jump overboard. The men thought he seemed a little wild and excitable, and they believed that he might just jump into the nearby river Tyne, so decided to do as he asked and take him to the police station. Chief Constable Hewish found Oscar sitting on a seat in the police station with his head in his hands, sobbing. He said, I have killed her. She drugged me and stole seven pounds off me. She stole another fifteen pounds off me later. Chief Constable Hewish asked him who he had killed and he replied by saying, Mary Ann Maguire, I strangled her with my silk handkerchief. At this point, Rebecca Varty had entered the police station to report the murder. She said, Mary Ann is dead and pointed to Oscar, adding, he is the man who did it. 
Oscar was then charged with the willful murder of Mary Ann Maguire. The day after the murder of Mary Ann, her father James was arrested for being drunk and incapable. He said he had been upset by his daughter's death and did not know what he was doing. However, the magistrate said that this had been his 13th appearance for similar offences and fined him two shillings and warned him to stay away from the drink. The inquest, which had been adjourned from August the 13th, was held at the town hall buildings in North Shields on Wednesday, August the 22nd. Rebecca Varty, who lived at Miller's Bank with Mary Ann's father, said she had identified the body at the mortuary as being the daughter of James Maguire. Rebecca also stated that when she found Mary Ann, she had tried to remove the handkerchief from around her neck. It was then that she had realised she was dead and had gone for help. She knew that the handkerchief belonged to Oscar Matson. She also claimed to have heard him say a few days earlier to Mary Ann's father that if she refused to marry him, he would buy a revolver and blow her brains out. James Maguire said that on Friday, August the 10th, he had returned home to find the couple in his house. Oscar had immediately got up and shook his hand, saying that he had got back for another visit and was going to marry Mary Ann. He also claimed that Oscar had said he would murder her if she refused to marry him. Ellen Clough of the Cobble Inn on Bell Street said she had spoken to Oscar on Monday morning when he had come into the pub with his can asking for beer and a drink. She said he seemed to be in a hurry but she didn't see where he went when he left. John Smith and Robert Young both spoke of being in Bell Street when Oscar had asked them to asked them to take him to the police station. They said he kept repeating, I've killed her and I've done it, over and over as they walked him to the police station. However, he never said to them who he had killed. Dr. Brumwell said he had performed the post-mortem on the body of Mary Ann and he was without doubt that she had died due to strangulation. Chief Constable Hewish stated that Oscar had admitted to killing Mary Ann. He had said he didn't want her to live an immoral life and that she had gone to a better place now. He said that after Rebecca Varty had arrived at the police station, both he and Dr Brumwell had gone to the rooms in Bland Square where they had found Mary Ann on the bed, just as Oscar had described it. The jury at the inquest took only a few moments to return a verdict of guilty of willful murder and Oscar Matson was committed for trial. The funeral of Mary Ann took place on Friday, August the 17th. It was said to be a very small funeral, a plain and simple coffin without a nameplate, and just a handful of mourners were in attendance at Preston Cemetery where she was buried. They had travelled from the mortuary at the low lights to the cemetery, but it is not stated if people had lined the roads to pay their respects. The service was conducted by the Reverend John Butcher, and it was said that afterwards two bouquets of real flowers tied with white silk ribbons were placed upon the grave. The trial took place on November the 19th, 1900 before Mr Justice Grantham. It was said that Oscar appeared to be a little dazed as he stood in the dock and when asked how he pleaded he had replied in a low and somewhat shaky voice, not guilty. It was stated that Oscar had known Mary Ann for around four to five years and that he had often visited North Shields with his ship and whenever he had been there he had visited Mary Ann and they had been mostly on good terms and spent most of his leave with her. At the time of the crime she lived alone in Bland Square and her father lived in Miller's Bank with Rebecca Varty. Rebecca and Mary Ann were friends and it was never suggested at any time that Rebecca and James Maguire were in any kind of relationship other than that of landlord and lodger. It was stated that on the Friday that from the Friday of his arrival until the Monday morning of the murder, Oscar and Mary Ann had spent a lot of time together, spending the Friday evening at the theatre in South Shields. On the Saturday morning, it was said that Oscar had gone to the shop of a Mr. Merkel, it is not stated where this shop was, and bought the silk handkerchief which had been found around the neck of Mary Ann. He had gone back to the shop later that afternoon in a somewhat agitated manner and asked to be sold a revolver and bullets. However, the shop owner had not liked his manner and refused to sell the items to him. 
It was also said that on Monday morning, Marianne had gone to her father's house. Her father appeared to be going to work, and at 6.30am, Mary Ann and Rebecca Vartley went to a public house in North Shields and began drinking. They then went to a second pub where they met James Maguire and another unnamed man, James having gone to the pub and not to work. The four continued drinking until around 7.30am when they returned to Miller's Bank. Mary Ann and Rebecca left there sometime after 8am and Mary Ann returned to her rooms at Bland Square. Rebecca did not go inside with her. Oscar had not been with them when they had been to the public houses, but it was believed that he had been in her rooms waiting for her return. Rebecca had made arrangements with Mary Ann to return to her rooms at around 9am. Rebecca Varty, John Smith, Robert Young and Ellen Clough all gave the same evidence that they had given at the inquest. However, I must add that Rebecca stated that she did not know that Mary Ann was working the streets of North Shields to earn her living. James Maguire stated that Mary Ann was his only daughter and that he could think of no reason why she would have refused to marry Oscar. He said that he had known Oscar for around four or five years and knew him to be very fond of his daughter. He said he could not say if Oscar had ever objected to his daughter's lifestyle. She was, in his opinion, not an unfortunate. When cross-examined, he said it was not true that he had lived on the immoral earnings of his daughter. It was true, however, that Sergeant Proud had once arrested him for living on the immoral earnings of two women, but he claimed he had been convicted on false evidence and sent to prison for three months. When asked if one of these women had been his daughter, he said he had been told so, but she had not been living with him at the time, so he did know, not know what she had been doing for work. He also went on to state that Oscar had never complained to him of having been robbed by his daughter and that he had certainly never been drugged while in his house. He had not believed the threats made in regard to killing his daughter, but he had heard Oscar say he would kill himself several times in the past and he did think that this might have been something that he would have done. Chief Constable Hewish gave almost the same evidence as that at the inquest, but he added that on retrieving the silk handkerchief and showing it to Oscar, he had become very upset and said, Take it away. This is what I did it with. I do not want her to live a life of prostitution. I wanted to marry her. Oscar gave evidence on his own behalf. He was said to speak quite good and clear English, but having worked on British ships for around 10 years, he had learned the language quite quickly. He started by saying that he had known Mary Ann, who he called Minnie, for around six years, which was a little longer than her father had suggested. He said he had always wanted to marry her, more so when she had been an innocent and not working the streets. He said he had visited North Shields many times and would always stop with Mary Ann. He said every time he visited she would agree to marry him and he said that she often gave him a drink at night and he would then wake up the next morning to find his money had been taken and he always went back to his ship without her marrying him but he never gave up hope. He said it was untrue that on the night of the 10th, when at her father's home in Miller's Bank, that he had said he would murder her if she did not marry him. However, he did say that he had said many times that he would kill himself. He claimed that on Saturday the 11th, he had gone into the Black Swan public house, and here he had seen Mary Ann with another man. He said he had heard her ask this man to take, him, take her up to the room. When asked if he had been with her that night, he said no, the other man was with her all night. He admitted that it was true that he had gone into the shop to buy a revolver, but he said he had not just tried to buy one in this shop, but also two other shops when he had been in London, but on each occasion had been unsuccessful. He claimed when he went to buy one on the Saturday, it was because he wanted to use it on himself. He had been so upset at losing his money again, the money he claimed that Mary Ann had stolen from him, and it had depressed him so much that he had wanted to take his own life. He said he had spent Sunday with Mary Ann and they had planned to marry on the Monday morning, but when he woke he found that she had gone. 
She returned a while later and gave him some whiskey. He said her father had called at the house. However, her father did not mention this in his testimony. After fa her father had left, he had got up and dressed and this was when he found that more of his money was gone. He then decided to check the pockets of Mary Ann's clothing and found her purse containing gold, silver and copper coins. He told Mary Ann that this was some of his money and that she had stolen it from him. He said he had had enough and he was going to leave and she told him to get out. But how, he said, could he pay at the sailor's home when she had taken all of his money? Where could he go? And he said she had told him that she did not care where he went, that he could go and strangle or drown himself. As a Russian man, he said he had not heard the word strangle before and did not know what it meant. He said that Marianne took his handkerchief, knotted it and put it over her head and round her neck, saying this is how to strangle someone. She then told him to get out, swearing at him and calling him ugly, and then she spat at him. It was, he said, at this point that he lost control, remembering all the things he felt she had done him to him over the many years of visits and how she was speaking to him now. He grabbed hold of one end of the handkerchief and pulled it tight round her neck. He said he did this twice, the second time she fell down onto the bed. He said he told her, I will give you a lesson and you will have a headache for a couple of days. He did not realise she was dead when she had fallen onto the bed. He tried to loosen the handkerchief. She was not moving or waking up. Then thinking that perhaps beer would revive her, he picked up the can and went to buy some. He said when he had asked the men he met in Bell Street to take him to the police station, he did not know that Mary Ann was dead. He said he had killed her as he was afraid they would not take him to the police station for anything less, and if they had not, he would have drowned himself. He had not meant to kill her, only frighten her. When cross-examined, he said she had stolen from him many times, even one time stealing £80 from him. He said that after the first time she had agreed to marry him, he had given up drink and smoking to save for their wedding, and each time it was this money that she had stolen from him. The defence said that this was a very sad story. There was no way that he could suggest that it was anyone other than Oscar who had tightened the handkerchief around Mary Ann's neck, but he had evidence of provocation and that Oscar had acted in a moment of madness and this, he felt, would give the jury the option to reduce the charge to one of manslaughter. He said there had been a great deal of sympathy for the poor man who had clearly cared a great deal for Mary Ann and for all she had done to him over the years, he had, until now, behaved with great kindness towards her. The judge, in summing up, said he could not agree with the defence in saying that if someone killed in anger, it was not murder. He also said that the story told by Oscar had been a strange one, and showed him as a man of little intelligence to keep going back to a woman who believed it was stealing money from him every time he visited, and whose life on the streets he did not approve of. The jury retired for only 10 minutes before returning the verdict of guilty of willful murder against Oscar Matson. The judge then sentenced Oscar to death by hanging and that his remains would be buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. At this point, Oscar spoke, saying to the judge, I beg your pardon, can I be executed in the shortest possible time, say a day or two? To which the judge replied, telling him this would not be the case and that the law would take its usual course. At this, Oscar was removed from the dock and returned to Newcastle Prison to await his fate. And the date for the execution was set for Tuesday, December the 11th, 1900. As was often the case, a petition was started for a reprieve for Oscar Mudson. It was said that it received well over 12,000 signatures, including that of Lord Armstrong, several MPs and the mayors of both Newcastle and Tynemouth, and it was also signed by at least eight members of the jury who had convicted him of the murder. It was not clear why so many well-known people had signed the petition, but it did seem to help, as by December the 4th, a letter was received from the Home Office stating that the death sentence had been respited until further notice and Oscar would now be sent to prison for the rest of his life. 
On December the 6th, a letter from the Russian consulate was printed in the local papers, expressing their gratitude to those who had signed the petition to save Oscar's life. I was unable to find details of when Oscar was first moved, but by 1911 he could be found at Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. It had at first been hoped that he would be allowed to return to Russia to serve out his sentence, but it would not be until 1913 that he was released from Parkhurst Prison and deported back to Russia. And I have looked, but I have found no further trace of him. Sadly, it would seem that James Maguire did not st stop his drinking habits or keep in company with what were called in those days unfortunates. Rebecca Varty still lived at his home in Miller's Bank and in late December of 1900, James found himself in court accused of attacking Rebecca with a poker. She said he had also tried to strangle her, saying he would put her where his daughter was. He denied having done this but was found guilty and was sent to prison for one month. Strangely, in 1901, James could be found still living with Rebecca in Miller's Bank, but he was now the lodger living in her home. I was not able to find any further details of either James or Rebecca after this date. This was an incredibly sad story. It would seem that after the death of her mother, Mary Ann's life had changed dramatically, leaving home and beginning her life of work in the streets. Her father, it seems, was often found drunk and incapable, and it would seem once even living off the immoral earnings of his daughter. Oscar, it seems, had been besotted with the young girl, willing to allow her to steal from him and hoping that one day she would marry him and leave her life of prostitution and drinking behind. But this would not be the case, and instead he would end up strangling the woman he said he loved so much. Two young lives were destroyed, one in death and the other who was sent to prison and then had to live with the guilt of what he had done. And I do wonder what happened to Oscar once he returned back to Russia. So what do you think about this story? Did Oscar act in a moment of madness? Did Marianne really provoke him? Did Marianne really steal his money? And did Marianne ever have a chance of a better life, with her father often found to be drunk and not working? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. It certainly does seem to be another story that highlights the evils of drink in times gone by. I do hope that you have found this sad and tragic story interesting and I do apologise once again as a live recording I do make one or two mistakes and I do try to correct them each time and I do hope that it doesn't spoil your enjoyment of the story and I thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.